Hey dear, welcome back to the world of cross-dressing stories. If you're new here, please consider subscribing. Now, let's dive into the story. My name is Richard, and if you met me on the street, you might think I'm just another ordinary guy. I live in a quiet suburb with my wife, Jane, where our days blend seamlessly into one another. Commutes, coffee, and the casual comfort of a long-standing relationship. But beneath this everyday exterior lies a secret that for years I kept confined to the deepest corners of my heart. You see, ever since I can remember, I've been drawn to women's clothing. The textures, the colors, the way the fabrics moved. It all seemed so expressive, so vibrant, compared to the standard attire assigned to my gender. This fascination wasn't something I could share, not even with Jane, who has been my partner in life for over 15 years. One week, Jane was scheduled for a business trip out of state, the kind that would keep her away for a few days. It was during this time, alone and unwatched, that I decided to let my hidden self breathe. It began simply, an idle curiosity to walk a mile in her shoes, quite literally. I remember standing in front of our closet, my hands trembling slightly as I slid the doors open. The scent of her perfume lingered on her clothes, and it felt like an invisible line was being crossed as I reached for one of her dresses. It was a soft, floral piece that I had always admired on her. The fabric felt cool and smooth as I slipped it over my head, the skirt swirling around my knees. Next came the makeup. I had watched Jane apply it countless times, a dab of blush here, a stroke of mascara there, the transformation was clumsy at first, but with each brush stroke, I saw someone else looking back at me from the mirror, a version of myself that felt more complete than I had anticipated. For hours, I explored this new persona, reveling in a freedom I had never known. But as the sun began to set, casting long shadows through our home, the unexpected sound of the front door clicking open shattered the calm. My heart lurched into my throat. It was too early for Jane to be back, wasn't it? She walked in, her face tired from travel, her eyes widening in disbelief as she took in the scene before her. There I was, clad in her clothes, her lipstick slightly smudged on my lips from my nervous biting. The bag in her hand dropped to the floor with a thud, the sound echoing like a verdict being passed. Richard, what, what is this? Her voice was a mix of shock, confusion, and something else. Hurt, maybe. I stood frozen, the joy of moments ago curdling into dread. How could I explain this part of me that I barely understood myself? The silence stretched painfully between us. I, I can explain, I stammered, but the words died in my throat. How do you explain a lifetime of hidden longing in a single breath? Jane looked from me to the dress and back again. I need some time, she said quietly, her voice trembling. Without another word, she turned and left the room. I heard the bedroom door close softly behind her. That night, we lay in the same house, yet worlds apart. The bed felt colder, the silence between the walls thicker. I feared I might have lost her, my best friend, my partner, my confidant, all because I had dared to be myself, even if just for a few stolen moments. As I lay there listening to the soft patter of rain against the window, a tear slipped down my cheek. I realized then how much of myself I had kept locked away, not just from the world, but from the person I loved most. And now, I wondered if the cost of that concealment might be more than I could bear. The days following Jane's discovery were some of the longest and most silent in our marriage. We moved around each other like two planets in the same system, bound by gravity yet spinning in isolation. Meals were quiet affairs, and conversations were reduced to the bare essentials. Each morning, I woke up with a heaviness, fearing that each passing day was stretching the distance between us too far to bridge. Finally, unable to bear the widening chasm, I asked Jane if we could talk. That evening, we sat across from each other in our living room, the setting sun casting long shadows that seemed to echo the somber mood. I took a deep breath, my heart pounding with a mix of dread and desperation. Jane, I owe you an explanation, I began, my voice unsteady. This isn't easy for me to talk about. It's something I've hidden for so long, not out of shame, but fear. Fear of not being understood, of losing the people I love. Jane's eyes, though still tinged with confusion, held a flicker of compassion that gave me the courage to continue. Ever since I was young, I've felt a connection to these expressions of myself that don't fit into the conventional boxes. Wearing women's clothes, experimenting with makeup, 
It's not just about the clothes. It's a part of me that I feel I need to express. It makes me feel complete, more myself in a way I can't fully articulate. As I spoke, I watched her face, bracing for rejection. Instead, Jane reached across the space between us, taking my hand in hers. Her touch, warm and familiar, felt like an anchor. I can't pretend I understand all of this, Richard, she said softly, but I do know that I love you. All of you, even the parts I'm just now seeing. If this is something that's a part of you, then it's a part of us. Maybe we should talk to someone, someone professional who can help us through this. Relief washed over me, mingling with love and gratitude. Together we found a therapist who specialized in gender identity and relationships. Those sessions were not easy. There were moments of discomfort, of vulnerability that felt almost too much to bear. But as we delved deeper into my experiences and feelings, Jane's presence felt less like a specter of judgment and more like a companion on a journey neither of us expected but were willing to navigate together. Through therapy, we learned the language to discuss what cross-dressing meant for me and for our marriage. Jane asked questions, her curiosity overruling her initial shock. She learned about my desires not only to express but to feel seen in this identity, and slowly the frost around us thawed. As our understanding deepened, so did our connection. We started incorporating this part of my identity into our relationship more openly. Jane helped me pick out clothes, sometimes laughing alongside me as we shared moments of lighthearted fun that had been missing for too long. It was during these times that I saw the woman I fell in love with, her strength, her compassion, her unwavering ability to love unconditionally. One evening, as we prepared for a night out with me dressed in my new attire, Jane smiled at me through the mirror. I see you, she said, her words simple but profound, and I love what I see. Those words, more affirming than any garment I could wear, wrapped around me like a warm embrace. In that moment, I realized that this journey, fraught with fears and uncertainties, was also filled with the possibility of rediscovery, not just of myself, but of us, together. It was a new chapter for us, one that promised not just acceptance, but a deeper, more authentic love. Life seemed to be settling into a new, hopeful rhythm, with each day weaving stronger threads of understanding and affection between Jane and me. However, the peace we had begun to cherish was about to be shattered by a chilling turn of events. It started with an anonymous letter slipped under our door one crisp morning. The plain, unassuming envelope belied the venomous words it contained. As I unfolded the paper with trembling hands, my blood ran cold. There, in stark, menacing type, was a threat to unravel everything I had fought so hard to protect. The letter demanded a substantial sum of money, with the explicit warning that failure to comply would result in my cross-dressing sessions being exposed to my colleagues and everyone else in our tightly knit community. The shock of the betrayal was palpable. The realization that someone had been spying on me invading our private sanctuary, felt like a violation of the most personal kind. Jane and I sat across from each other at the kitchen table, the letter lying like a dark omen between us. Her hand reached for mine, squeezing tightly, a silent vow of solidarity. We can't let this person control our lives, Jane said, her voice firm despite the shadows of fear in her eyes. This isn't just about the money, it's about our right to live freely, without fear. Her courage ignited my resolve. We decided to confront the blackmailer, to take back the power that was being stolen from us. With careful planning, we traced the origin of the demands to our neighbor, a seemingly innocuous man who had always nodded politely in passing, but whom we now realized had been harboring a sinister secret. Armed with our decision to face him, we went to his house under the guise of discussing a neighborhood issue. The moment he opened the door, the air thickened with unspoken tension. We confronted him, the letter in hand, demanding an explanation. The neighbor's facade crumbled, revealing a desperate man driven by greed and opportunism. He confessed to installing hidden cameras, not out of malice, but out of a misguided attempt to solve his financial ruin through blackmail. The gravity of his actions seemed to dawn on him as he spoke, his voice faltering, his posture deflating. The showdown was less violent than anticipated, but no less dramatic. There, in his dimly lit living room, surrounded by the mundane trappings of his life, 
we saw the face of our tormentor, a man so consumed by his own problems that he failed to see the humanity in those he victimized. Jane and I stood firm, stating we would not be blackmailed and that we would take legal action if necessary. The threat of exposure to the authorities made him recoil, his earlier defiance dissolving into pleas for mercy. We will not ruin your life, Jane declared, but we require all recordings and assurances that our privacy will be respected from now on. He agreed, dismantling his equipment in front of us, handing over all materials he had collected. The walk back home was quiet, each step away from the house feeling like a step back towards a semblance of peace. That night, as Jane and I sat once again in our living room, the curtains drawn a bit tighter than before, we reflected on the fragility of trust and the resilience required to rebuild it. Our journey had taken yet another unexpected detour, but together we found strength in our shared battles and in our commitment to defend the life we were determined to live authentically and openly. The ordeal with our neighbor was a painful reminder of the dangers still lurking in the shadows, but it also reaffirmed the power of standing united in the face of adversity. Just when Jane and I thought we had navigated the stormiest seas, the winds shifted, ushering in a gale that threatened to pull us deeper into uncharted waters. Our confrontation with the neighbor had not, it seemed, closed the chapter of our troubles, but had inadvertently turned the page to reveal a more sinister plot. A few days after the showdown, we received a visit from two plainclothes detectives. They introduced themselves in our living room, the same space that had witnessed our many struggles and victories. With a gravity that immediately captured our full attention, they explained that our neighbor's activities were merely the tip of an iceberg. A larger, more dangerous criminal organization was at play, engaged in extensive extortion and other illicit activities. The revelation was staggering. It appeared that the recordings of me were intended not just for blackmail, but potentially as leverage in a network of crimes far beyond simple extortion. The detectives laid out their cards. They had been tracking this organization for months, and our confrontation had inadvertently propelled the investigation forward. We believe you could be instrumental in bringing this group down, one detective explained, his eyes locked on mine, searching for any sign of hesitation. Your unique situation, your courage in facing your blackmailer, and frankly, your skills in disguise could be pivotal. The room spun slightly as I processed his words. Jane squeezed my hand, her presence a grounding force as always. The idea of going undercover, of actively participating in a police operation was something out of a crime thriller, not our lives. Yet here it was, laid out before us as a path we might choose to take. After a long night of discussion, where fears mingled with a strong sense of duty, we agreed. If our ordeal could somehow contribute to a greater good, perhaps it was worth facing these demons head on. Training for the undercover operation was intense. I learned not just the basics of surveillance, but also the psychological aspects of infiltration. My ability to adopt another persona, a skill honed in secrecy and shadow, now had a critical purpose. The irony wasn't lost on me, I was using a part of myself I had once thought of as a vulnerability as a shield and weapon against wrongdoing. The plan was risky. I was to attend a high-stakes gathering of the organization, posing as a potential investor with a penchant for extravagant, flamboyant displays of wealth, a disguise that allowed me to use my experience in cross-dressing to full effect. Jane played the role of my assistant, her sharp intellect and attention to detail crucial in managing communications and ensuring our safety. The night of the operation, my heart pounded as I adjusted the tailored suit that clung to my frame, the fabric foreign yet empowering. Makeup, once a tool for exploration, now served as armor, masking my true identity, enhancing another. Jane, ever my anchor, adjusted my tie with steady hands, her eyes reflecting a cocktail of fear and pride. As we entered the venue, a lavish hotel that glittered with the opulence befitting the criminal elite, my senses heightened. Every glance, every conversation felt charged with potential danger. But beneath the adrenaline, there was also a strange exhilaration, the thrill of the performance, the rush of playing a role that mattered beyond myself. The evening was a blur of coded conversations and subtle exchanges. I navigated the murky waters of criminal dialogue, my every move 
every word calculated and precise. Jane, ever vigilant, kept our backup informed through discreet earpiece her own role as crucial as mine. Hours felt like days until the operation reached its crescendo, an exchange that would lead to the arrest of key figures. When the moment came, the swift entry of law enforcement shattered the facade of the evening. Amidst the chaos, Jane and I held on to each other, a silent acknowledgement that we had made it through, that our gamble had paid off. As we drove home in the early hours of the morning, the city's lights blurred past us. We were tired, shaken, but underneath it all, there was a profound sense of accomplishment. We had stepped into the abyss, not out of folly, but out of a desire to right a wrong that had inadvertently entangled us. Our journey into the depths had revealed not just the darkness that lay beneath, but the strength we possessed together. It was a chapter our lives that would forever remind us of the power of truth, courage, and the unbreakable bond we shared. The culmination of our undercover work was set to unfold at a grand masquerade ball, an event dripping with opulence and secrecy, perfect for the clandestine exchanges of the criminal elite. The venue, a palatial estate hidden away from prying eyes, was adorned with extravagant decorations and masks that provided a veil of anonymity under which nefarious deals thrived. As Jane and I prepared for the evening, the weight of our task hung heavy in the air between us. She helped me into an elaborate costume that was both a shield and a statement, a richly embroidered cloak with a matching mask adorned with intricate beadwork. The persona I adopted was flamboyant and confident, a stark contrast to the fluttering nerves beneath my composed exterior. Jane, dressed in a sleek, elegant gown that complemented her role as my assistant, offered a reassuring smile as she adjusted my mask. Remember, we're almost there, she whispered, her voice a tether to our shared resolve. The ball was a surreal tableau of masked faces and whispered secrets. The air was thick with the perfume of wealth and the undercurrents of danger. As I moved through the crowd, the fabric of my cloak whispering against the marble floors, I felt the weight of every glance that slid my way. Each interaction was a play of shadows and innuendo, each conversation a dance around the fire of our hidden intent. At my side, Jane was a constant presence, her sharp eyes missing nothing. She subtly pointed out the key players, using cues we had memorized during our briefings. We knew who we needed to charm, who to avoid, and most critically, who held the evidence we desperately needed. As the evening progressed, I found myself face to face with the kingpin, a man whose benign appearance belied the ruthlessness that had brought him to power. His mask, an ornate creation of gold filigree, did little to hide the calculating coldness of his gaze. We exchanged pleasantries, a verbal sparring masked beneath layers of feigned admiration and interest. Your reputation precedes you, he commented, his voice smooth like silk, dangerous like a blade. I trust you are finding the evening to your taste? Indeed, it is a night of fascinating discoveries, I replied, my voice steady despite the pounding of my heart. One could find themselves quite invested in the opportunities presented. Our conversation was a chess match, each word a move, each glance a strategy. As we spoke, I maneuvered him toward the private study, a room I knew from our intelligence contained the crucial documents we needed. The moment we were inside, away from the watchful eyes of the other guests, I knew our chance had come. Jane, ever vigilant, gave me a slight nod, confirming that the room was clear of any other threats. With a deep breath, I steered the conversation towards investments in security, words that were our agreed signals. At that moment, law enforcement, hidden just out of sight, knew to prepare for the breach. The tension in the room peaked as I sensed the impending interruption. My heart raced, every second stretching out as I awaited the signal. Then it came, the sound of footsteps, the door bursting open, agents flooding in with a precision that spoke of months of preparation. The kingpin's shock was palpable, his composure shattering as he realized the trap that had been laid out so meticulously. As he was restrained, I turned away, Jane's hand finding mine, squeezing it tightly in silent victory and relief. As we were escorted out, away from the chaos that erupted behind us, the masks of the guests fell away, revealing the stark faces of fear and surprise. Jane and I walked through the dispersing crowd, our steps light, almost surreal in their normalcy after what had transpired. 
In the safety of our getaway car, as the estate shrank into the distance, I allowed myself to finally exhale, the adrenaline slowly ebbing from my veins. We had done it, stepped into the lion's den and emerged not just unscathed, but triumphant. The documents were secured, the criminals apprehended, and our roles as instruments of justice were concluded, at least for that night. The drive home was quiet, a reflective pause after the storm of emotions. Jane's presence next to me was a comforting constant, her support the cornerstone of my courage throughout this ordeal. As the city lights glimmered in the distance, signaling our return to normalcy, I realized that this climax was not just a victory over the criminal elements, but a profound affirmation of our strength and unity. We had navigated the most perilous waters together, and now the journey forward seemed a little less daunting, our bond a lot more unbreakable. As dawn broke over the city, the air carried a crispness that felt like the turning of a page after a long, tumultuous chapter. The events of the masquerade ball had unfolded with a precision that, in retrospect, seemed almost cinematic. The criminals, caught unawares and red-handed with incriminating evidence, were taken into custody, their network unraveled by the very plans they had so arrogantly laid. For Jane and me, the end of the operation was not just a conclusion, but a beginning. My role in the ordeal remained cloaked in secrecy, a shadow identity that dissolved with the night, allowing me to maintain the anonymity necessary to protect my professional life. Yet, within the walls of our home, the masks we wore fell away, revealing not just our true selves, but a bond that had been forged stronger in the fires of adversity. In the weeks that followed, our life regained a semblance of normalcy, but with a renewed sense of appreciation for each other. Jane's embrace of my cross-dressing identity, once a source of hidden shame, had evolved into an open celebration of my whole self. It was during a quiet evening, as we sat reflecting on all that had passed, that Jane suggested we renew our vows. Let's promise once again to stand by each other, no matter what comes, she said, her hand clasped in mine, her eyes shining with tears of joy and resilience, this time with no parts of us left in the shadows. The vow renewal was a simple yet profound ceremony held in our garden. The autumn air was light with the scent of blooming flowers, a gentle reminder of renewal and growth. We stood, hand in hand, surrounded by a small circle of friends who had supported us, who had offered us strength in our moments of doubt, and who celebrated our authenticity without reservation. I wore an outfit that felt uniquely me, a tasteful blend of masculine and feminine styles that represented my journey. Jane, radiant and understanding as ever, wore a dress that echoed my theme, a symbol of her unwavering support. As we spoke our vows, our voices steady but filled with emotion, we promised to honor and cherish not only each other's presence but each other's truths, whatever they might be. The words felt like a seal over our past trials and a promise for whatever lay ahead. After the ceremony, we hosted a small celebration in our home. The atmosphere was light and joyful, filled with laughter and music, a stark contrast to the dark days we had faced. As I mingled with our guests, the freedom to be fully myself without fear or pretense felt like the truest form of liberation. Later, as the last guest departed and quiet settled over our home, Jane and I took a moment to stand together in our garden under the vast, starlit sky. We reflected on the journey we had undertaken, the challenges we had overcome, and the unexpected adventure that had brought us even closer. Who would have thought, I mused aloud, that embracing who I truly am would lead us here? Jane squeezed my hand, her smile tender and knowing. I always knew, she replied, that whatever path we took, as long as we walked it together, it would lead us to happiness. And as we stood there in the soft embrace of the night, I realized that every step, every challenge had been worth it. For in finding the courage to face the world as my true self, I had not only protected and strengthened my love with Jane, but had also discovered an inner strength I had never known I possessed. This wasn't just the end of our ordeal, but a new beginning, a second chance at living not just truthfully, but triumphantly.